Well, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm still Martha Minow, and I'm unbelievably delighted to be welcoming here in the series on election law. And for those of you in the class with Professor Freed, um, thank you for your participation. Uh, and uh, to welcome Trevor Potter. Trevor Potter is uh, one of the most outstanding uh, figures and leaders in the field of election law. He was chair of the Federal Election Commission uh, after serving as commissioner. And uh, his expertise includes his work um, on the Campaign Legal Center and other organizations that are playing a vital role uh, in campaign law. Uh, he also uh, has an active practice uh, and um, served as general counsel to John McCain's presidential campaigns. Um, I giving him all of my time. Thank you. Thank you all. This is a uh, very impressive turnout. Um, I have to say it's not quite as large as the turnout I had at Yale last year, though, <laughs> when I was asked to come and deliver the dean's lecture to the Yale Law School. Of course, I was very puffed up about that, but um, there's a reason that their turnout was larger, and I'm not unmindful of it. Uh, I was one of two speakers delivering the dean's lecture because I received a phone call about a month before that lecture uh, from my client, Stephen Colbert. <laughs> and he said, I have been asked to deliver the dean's lecture at the Yale Law School on the subject of my super PAC. And in thinking about it, I realized they might want me to discuss the law. <laughs> and that would be something of a problem. Are you free that day? So I, I understand the Yale turnout was for uh, Stephen Colbert and not for me. And that means you are the losers because you ended up with me and not Stephen. And as I was reminded when I first went on that show to talk about super PACs by the staffer who stood behind me and whispered in my ear before I was pushed out on stage, she leaned over and she said, just remember, he's the funny one. <laughs> So I'm afraid you have the boring, stiff one with you today. Uh, but it's a great topic, so I think it uh, will, to some extent, speak for itself. What I hope to do is talk for a while, um, probably longer than I hope, but we'll see, and then have time for uh, questions and discussion. So I thank the dean for the opportunity to be here and participate in, in this series. Uh, since I am not a constitutional law professor, I'm going to focus more on the administrative side and what I'd call perhaps the Washington side, which I've been immersed in uh, either as an FEC commissioner or as a practicing lawyer and more recently as a would-be reformer. Uh, I think the narrative of this election cycle has been dominated so far by two themes, voter anger with the status quo and money. Uh, voter anger is beyond the scope of this talk except as it relates to citizens' views about the corrupting effects of money on elections and governance, which I will get to. Money, as covered by the press, is about which candidate or super PAC has the most money, which billionaire is sponsoring which player, I mean candidate, how the candidate super PACs are spending their early money, how to guess the origins of the dark money that is being spent through candidate nonprofits that do not disclose their donors, who has run out of money and is about to leave the race, and who can convince those former candidates' major donors to switch allegiances and support their own candidates' super PACs and dark money nonprofits. I think it's fair to say that the traditional horse race is currently the money race. Campaign finance has become such a prevalent issue that, as you may have heard, there's even a Harvard Law professor running for president whose campaign is focused solely on this issue. Someone I have worked with and I wish good luck to because, as you will hear, I think this issue needs a lot of focus. The new money world is described accurately by the press as the post-Citizens United world, and less accurately as the result of Citizens United. 
But Citizens United is a good place to start in discussing the current Supreme Court 5-4 majority in favor of campaign finance deregulation and the effects of that majority. As you know, there was a different 5-4 majority before, the McConnell v. FEC decision upholding the reform law was a 5-4 majority. By the way, a footnote here, the reform law is known as the McCain-Feingold shays mian law to identify its four principal bipartisan sponsors, or the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act. Uh, in Washingtonese and in court decisions that is frequently referred to as BICRA, B-C-R-A, uh, it rhymes with bicker, although the philosophical arguments run a little deeper than mere bickering. The 5-4 majority that upheld BICRA disappeared with the retirement of Justice Sandra Day O'Connor and her replacement by Justice Samuel Alito. Today is the first time in U.S. history that no former elected officials serve on the Supreme Court. The court is an institution populated for more than 200 years by former governors, congressmen, senators, and even presidents. It now has nine former judges or academics, none of whom has ever served in a legislative branch or raised a campaign contribution. This may be good news for Harvard and Yale law students, but I don't think it is for our democracy, as I will explain. When the angry four dissenters in McConnell became the five-member majority, their ideological goal of deregulating money in politics and undoing the post-Watergate campaign finance system quickly became clear. In the first campaign finance case the new court dealt with, Wisconsin Right to Life, the majority undid part of BICRA's ban on the use of corporate money for election advertising. In that case, Chief Justice Roberts made his agenda clear. Speaking of the provision he was striking, he declared, enough is enough. Now, I have given entire speeches about the court's next campaign finance case, Citizens United, in 2010, and the flaws in the procedural consideration and holdings of that decision. I will not subject you to all of that today because my focus is not Citizens United per se, but the failure of our executive and legislative branches to function appropriately in response to it. To get there though, I need to describe what I see as the four basic failures of the Citizens United decision, failures of understanding and imagination. These result in the collision of abstract legal theory with reality. This is a collision that a court more familiar with political practices and administrative process and the difficulties of legislating might have predicted and avoided. First, disclosure. Writing in the only section of the Citizens United opinion that was approved by, signed by eight of the nine justices, Justice Thomas did not join that section, Justice Kennedy said, a campaign finance system that pairs corporate independent expenditures with effective disclosure has not existed before today. With the advent of the internet, Prompt disclosure of expenditures can provide shareholders and citizens with the information needed to hold corporations and elected officials accountable for their positions and supporters. Shareholders can determine whether their corporation's political speech advances the corporation's interest in making profits. And citizens can see whether elected officials are, quote, in the pocket of so-called moneyed interests. The second failure of the court in Citizens United is independent speech. The Supreme Court's theory since Buckley v. Vallejo has been that expenditures are wholly and completely 
independent of candidates and parties, and if so, they cannot corrupt those candidates or parties. The court theorized in Buckley that the independent speech might not be welcomed by the candidate because it could, could contain the wrong message or be unhelpful. In Citizens United, the court extended the protection of independent speech to corporations, which until then had only been for individuals. In doing so, Justice Kennedy said, by definition, an independent expenditure is political speech presented to the electorate that is not coordinated with a candidate. The third failure in Citizens United is corruption and the appearance of corruption. In Citizens United, Justice Kennedy changed the court's definition of corruption, which had first been enunciated in Buckley v. Vallejo in 1976, and he made it actual quid pro quo corruption, cash for official action or legislation. This reverses the standard used by the majority in McConnell, which said that selling meetings with members of Congress was both actual corruption and promoted the appearance of corruption. Justice Kennedy in Citizens United rejects both aspects of that conclusion, holding instead that selling influence and access is not corrupt because it is not quid pro quo corruption. He then challenges the appearance standard as well, concluding that, quote, the appearance of influence or access, furthermore, will not cause the electorate to lose faith in our democracy. We'll get there. <laughs> the fourth failure is an assumption that the law will be faithfully and fully administered. The majority assumes that the administrative apparatus of the federal government will ensure that the legal theories on which the court's rulings rely, that disclosure of money in politics will occur, that independent speech will in fact be independent, are the reality of our elections. This assumption relies on administrative agencies doing their jobs vigorously and effectively, and on Congress stepping in to correct any shortfalls. This is the theory, but not the reality. So let's look at what happened when the court's theories on disclosure, independence, the appearance of corruption, and administration met reality. First, the failure of disclosure. Justice Kennedy said a campaign finance system that pairs corporate independent expenditures with effective disclosure has not existed before today. That was true, but the reality is that such a decision did not exist after that day either. In fact, the system which is now in place post Citizens United in terms of transparency and disclosure looks nothing like what Justice Kennedy described. Let's start with the fact that corporations are not, in fact, required to disclose their political spending to shareholders. There is a proposal before the SEC since 2011, initiated by Professor Coates and others, which would require disclosure by publicly held corporations. The commission shows no sign of adopting it or even considering it. Contributions to super PACs are being made through anonymous shell corporations so that the identity of the true donors is obscured from the public. Meanwhile, and I think most shockingly, hundreds of millions of dollars are being spent in federal elections by what are called dark money groups, tax-exempt 501c4 and c6 organizations that are not required to disclose their donors to the public and do not do so. Now, the FEC could find that these dark money groups are political committees, but it has deadlocked 3-3 every time it has had the opportunity to do so. It could require the disclosure of the funders behind the shell corporations, but it has failed to do so. The IRS could find that the major purpose of these political C4s and C6s is political activity, therefore subject them to tax, reclassify them as 527 political organizations that do have to disclose their donors, but the IRS has not moved to do so and shows no sign of doing so. That's disclosure. How about independence? <clears throat> 
Unfortunately, this is a problem as well. Recall Justice Kennedy's words in Citizens United. By definition, an independent expenditure is political speech presented to the electorate that is not coordinated with a candidate. This requires, assumes, effective regulation and enforcement to ensure that independent efforts are actually independent and not coordinated with candidates in political parties. Yet again, the theory which was the basis for downplaying the consequences of Citizens United has met the reality of campaign practices and campaign practices have prevailed. Consider the situation of Carly for America. You may think I mean Carly Fiorini's presidential campaign, but I don't, because that would be Carly for president. Carly for America is her super PAC. You are excused for not being entirely clear on the difference. Listen to how the National Journal recently described Carly for America's activities, the super PAC. At a typical Fiorini campaign stop, a Carly for America staffer was stationed at a table outside the event space to sign up attendees for the super PAC email list. Another staffer handed out Carly for America stickers to attendees as they arrived. When Fiorina and her staff entered the event, they were met by a room covered in red Carly signs. Small print, Carly for America. Pro-Fiorina literature, all produced by Carly for America, was handed out by the totally independent, non-coordinating super PAC that just happens to be running her campaign events. This sort of interweaving of candidates and super PACs and dark money nonprofits is now occurring in almost every major federal campaign. Super PACs are established by candidates before they announce their candidacy, staffed by supporters selected by the candidate and campaign, usually former senior aides or close friends of the candidates, sometimes relatives, and broadcast ads are filmed in coordination with the candidate but run by the non-coordinating super PAC. Needless to say, and most importantly for purposes of the constitutional standard of preventing corruption and the appearance of corruption, the FEC has allowed candidates to solicit some contributions to these super PACs, coordinate fundraising events with them, and thank donors for contributing to the super PAC. As a result, donors achieve just what they seek from contributions to these super PACs, access and gratitude. Only they are giving what were until now unimaginable sums, $1 million, $10 million, contributions to the candidate's super PAC or nonprofit, rather than the $2,700 contribution that they are allowed to give to a candidate's official campaign committee. This leads to the third issue, the appearance of corruption. The court's present majority has stated that having large donors buy access or influence is not corrupt. Instead, they have said it is inherent in our democratic system that some will obtain more influence than others. Only quid pro quo corruption, the sale of specific official action for money, is corruption in that definition. Thus, Justice Kennedy stated in Citizens United, independent expenditures do not lead to or create the appearance of quid pro quo corruption. As for the sale of access and influence, not to worry. Justice Kennedy assures us that, quote, the appearance of influence or access furthermore will not cause the electorate to lose faith in our democracy. So how is that judicial theory holding up in reality? While public opinion polls aren't always germane to court decisions, this seems to me a different case. After all, the court is relying on its reading of public opinion in deciding what can be regulated as corruption. So was that reading correct? Well, it's not even close. A Bloomberg poll conducted just last month found the following. 
80% of Republicans, 83% of Democrats, think the court was wrong to allow unlimited corporate and labor spending in elections. Now think about that number. Where else do we find anything like that level of bipartisan agreement in today's politically polarized world? By contrast, when the same poll asked about the Supreme Court's decisions in the health care and marriage cases, the split was more what we might have expected, a 54-47 approval divided largely along partisan lines. Those numbers put the 80% bipartisan disapproval of Citizens United in a different context. The same survey found an incredible 87% of Americans, again over 80% of respondents of both political parties, agreeing with the statement, campaign finance should be reformed so that a rich person does not have more influence than a person with money. Let me say that again. 87% of Americans on a huge bipartisan basis agree with a statement that says campaign finance should be reformed so that a rich person does not have more influence than a person without money. This is obviously not only at odds with Citizens United, but also fundamentally with Supreme Court campaign finance jurisprudence since Buckley, which has rejected equality as a rationale for federal campaign finance regulation. Another result from the same poll is, if possible, even more shocking to me. More than half of all Americans, 59%, agree that, quote, the political system is broken and we just need to start over. Start over? <laughs> That would certainly require some changes in constitutional law classes at Harvard Law. The fourth failure of theory in Citizens United was the assumption that the federal administrative system would play its required role in enforcing the court's mandate for disclosure and independence. It is arguably at least in part the failure of the federal administrative system and the congressional deadlock, which prevents Congress from addressing this administrative failure, that has resulted in the chasm between the theories of Citizens United and today's reality. I have already referred to the failure of the IRS to address the problem of political groups masquerading as tax-exempt nonprofits in order to hide their donors, and the SEC's failure to require the disclosure of political activity to shareholders that the Supreme Court assumed would occur. But the FEC's epic failure to fulfill its role requires a little more explanation. The Federal Election Commission was created by Congress in the post-Watergate reforms as an independent regulatory agency. It has six commissioners, not more than three of any one party. So let's see, that would end up with probably three Republicans and three Democrats and by statute requires four votes to take any action, to hire or fire, to open an investigation, issue subpoenas, make findings of fact, sue in court to enforce its judgments, issue advisory opinions or regulations. This four vote requirement reflected Congress's concern that no one party be able to seize control of the FEC and use it as a partisan political tool. The agency, since its creation, has struggled with issues of regulatory capture because it regulates the activity of the two major political parties, all members of Congress and the President. And those are, coincidentally, the very players who determine who sits on the commission. The FEC was blamed for the advent of soft money in the 1980s and 90s, for instance, because it could not bring itself to say no to party committees. Nonetheless, for most of its existence, the FEC was seen as a fair and reasonably effective enforcement agencies, and commissioners worked hard behind the scenes to reach compromises and avoid any 3-3 deadlocks. When I served on the commission, my colleagues and I sometimes disagreed on how to enforce the law, <laughs> 
But we did all agree on one thing, that the FEC's job was to enforce the law, pass by Congress, and faithfully implement those laws. It was the job of the courts to determine if the laws were unconstitutional, and Congress's job to amend the statute if needed. There were commissioners who agreed with, disagreed with parts of the law, but they recognized that changing the law was not one of their powers, and so they left the call on whether to amend or invalidate the law to Congress and the courts. I can recall a fellow commissioner once saying to me, as she was about to vote in an enforcement action, I'll vote for this, but I hope we lose in court, because I think the law is wrong. That's not to say partisan issues never arose, but rather when they did arise, it was most often in the context of ensuring that our enforcement was even-handed across the political spectrum. In my time at the FEC, I remember commissioners of one party saying to those of another when a vote came up, I'll vote for this action against one of ours, but you better vote the same way when one of yours is here. There were seldom 3-3 three, three ties among the six commissioners. For example, there was an enforcement action by the commission during the first President Bush's term to investigate the incumbent president's 1988 presidential campaign. The allegation was that there had been coordination between the makers of the infamous Willie Horton advertisement and the campaign. That motion to open an investigation passed with bipartisan support. Now, compare that to today. FEC Chair Ann Ravel has publicly termed the commission, quote, worse than dysfunctional, and has said there is little chance that there will be any meaningful enforcement of campaign finance laws by the FEC in the 2016 cycle. The FEC repeatedly deadlocks 3-3 on even the most straightforward enforcement cases and on all major issues before the Commission in advisory opinions or rulemakings. Similarly, the FEC has deadlocked on the issue of determining whether an organization qualifies as a political committee subject to federal disclosure laws. In the five years following Citizens United, 29 coordination complaints have been brought before the Commission. Not a single one has had the votes to be investigated. It took nearly five years after the Citizens United decision for the FEC to muster four votes to issue the most basic notice of proposed regulation to bring the FEC's regulation in accord with the Supreme Court's decision which had struck out sections of those regulations. This was because the Democrats wanted to include in the notice proposals to strengthen the FEC's disclosure regulations, which the court had just upheld eight to one, and the three Republican commissioners refused to even allow the subject to be mentioned in the proposed notice. So how bad has it gotten? Well, earlier this year, in response to a proposal by Ellen Weintraub, one of the FEC's Democratic commissioners, to expedite enforcement matters by putting a deadline of a certain number of days during which they had to be addressed. She said that complaints were sitting in legal limbo for literally years. A Republican commissioner objected, saying that he had looked at the complaints sitting before the commission and there were far more complaints filed against Republicans than against Democrats. So this lack of parity justified the slow walking of the entire enforcement process. This failure by the FEC to even vote on cases has important consequences because the statute provides that the right to request court review of an agency's dismissal of a case occurs once the agency has voted and dismissed it, which they do if there's a deadlock. But if the case is never voted on, then the right to request court review can never be exercised. So where do we go next in terms of the Supreme Court's jurisprudence and the failure of the 
administrative system and of Congress to deal with that failure. Clearly, the post-Citizens United world, theorized by the court, was very, very different from the reality we have today. Some of this is the result of lower court action, which followed Citizens United, such as the DC Circuit decision in Speech Now, which effectively created super PACs by removing all contribution limits to super PACs, citing the independent spending cannot corrupt rationale of Citizens United. But much of what has happened since Citizens United is the result of the Supreme Court's failure to understand how regulatory issues and campaign practices would lead to a different reality than the one they theorized. Justice Kennedy had the following to say when testifying before Congress on the court's budget. Quote, we routinely decide cases involving federal statutes and we say, well, if this is wrong, the Congress will fix it. But then we hear that Congress can't pass the bill one way or the other and there's gridlock. And some people say, well, that should affect the way we interpret the statutes. That seems to me a wrong proposition. We have to assume that we have three fully functioning branches of the government that are committed to proceed in good faith and with goodwill toward one another to resolve the problems of this republic. In a vacuum, Justice Kennedy is probably right. It makes sense for judges when interpreting statutes to assume that regulators and legislators will continue to execute the basic functions of their job. But we're not in a vacuum. This isn't a theoretical exercise. There is overwhelming evidence pointing to a pattern of near complete failure on the part of the FEC, the IRS, the SEC, and other executive branch agencies to deal with campaign finance problems and violations. This is matched by complete partisan gridlock in Congress, which means Congress will not step in and correct these regulatory failures. During the battle over McCain-Feingold's soft money ban, Senator Susan Collins of Maine lamented that loopholes and lax enforcement, quote, have virtually destroyed our campaign finance laws, leaving us with little more than a pile of legal rubble. Legal rubble, it's an evocative term, and it would seem an accurate one today as well. The legal structures intended to protect the role of average Americans in our democratic system and prevent corruption and the appearance of corruption are being washed away in a tide of money from those with special interests to protect and advance. Unfortunately, this is 2015, not 2002. 13 years ago, in 2002, Republicans and Democrats joined together to pass a bipartisan law meant to take the rubble Senator Collins saw and rebuild it into a meaningful, effective system of disclosure and regulation. The Supreme Court upheld that reform at that time. Today, there is no chance that this Congress will act and a substantial likelihood the court would not, not uphold any legislation if Congress did. This unhappy result makes me worry about what that 59% of Americans who say we should, quote, start over are going to have in mind if it gets worse. Thank you very much. Now that I have painted that grim portrait, I would happy to be willing to discuss, among other things, whether there are any possible solutions to the situation we find ourselves in. And so let's take questions and have a discussion. And I see that the dean wants to uh, be the first one to grill me. Thank you so much for this uh, lucid presentation and for your work. What can people do to get agencies to act? And I'd add the FCC as well as the ones that you mentioned. Right, I left the FCC off of that because 
I wanted to leave a little time for questions, but uh, that's another one. I mean, there are laws that say that the true sponsor of the televised advertising has to be disclosed. And so I think, th and there's an old case out of the FCC which said saying, uh, you know, Americans for um, reform is not the true sponsor if they're really only two or three funders. Uh, the commission has shown no sign of doing that. The answer to the question, of course, is we have a theoretical administrative process that is taught in administrative law classes. You can file a petition uh, requesting a rulemaking. Uh, you can follow up asking the commission to act on your petition. Uh, they are supposed to consider it. They are supposed to explain their reasons and vote on whether to have such a rulemaking. If they decide not to, uh, there are opportunities to challenge that in court. But it, the, first of all, the process is so slow. Uh, if you have a, a petition before the SEC that has not been acted on in four years, well, we've gone through two cycles now of spending, three, I guess, on our way, uh, that's not working. And, and so uh, when you have agencies that for whatever reason uh, don't want to do something that the law appears to say, it's A, very difficult to get them to move contrary to, to their interests. And in the case of the FCC, they have a lot of broadcasters who don't want to have the law interpreted that way. Uh, then, even if you get the agency to vote and decide not to initiate the rulemaking, your next step is to challenge that action in court. That's another long process. Uh, in the case of the Federal Election Commission, when McCain-Feingold was adopted, uh, there were a series of rulemakings at the commission. The sponsors of, the congressional sponsors of McCain-Feingold filed uh, comments in those rulemakings saying, here is what we meant, here's the legislative record, here's what you should do and not do. The commission took a different view to the sponsors discuss because they thought they'd been pretty clear in the statute and in some cases that uh, what the commission adopted was simply flat out contrary to the statute. So they went to court and you have a you know, year, year and a half long process and finally you get a court decision. Fifteen times federal courts found, or in 15 different instances, federal courts found that what the FEC had done was arbitrary and capricious and contrary to law and sent it back to the agency to rewrite the regulations. Well, you would think that would solve the problem, but if you pause for a moment, they didn't tell them what the new regulation should say or order them to adopt that because that's not the court's role. They sent it back to action consistent with this decision. The FEC coordination regulations, which are at the source of so many of the problems we're seeing today, were challenged, held uh, contrary to law, sent back to the agency, rewritten. The new draft was, if possible, worse, sent back, taken back to court, new case filed, the whole thing before the same judge, thrown out again, sent back to the commission. Round three of the uh, coordination regulations was enacted. And those are really not very good, uh, but they're what we have. So, you know, it's frustrating uh, as you look at it as lawyers because we should have a system that is somehow more effectively and timely in responding to situations where an agency is not doing its job or where the regulations are not in accord with the statute, but we don't, we don't have that. And so if there is a situation where something is going to be dragged out by the agency, th there's relatively little you can do about it. Uh, just another example of that. Congress, which I suspect didn't know a lot about agencies, uh, or at least how to enforce laws when it wrote the uh, 1974 statute, has a provision in there that says anyone can file a complaint with the FEC, and then uh, if the agency has not dealt with it and disposed of it within 90 days, you can go to court and ask the court to require the agency to get a move on and order, ask the court to order the FEC to dispose of the case. Well, the reality turned out to be that the FEC could barely open a case in 90 days, never mind dispose of it. So Congress gave people a right that was not particularly practical. 
as a result, people would go to court, and the courts developed the habit of saying, oh yeah, another one of those cases. And they would bring in the FEC, and they would say, tell us what you've done, and the FEC would tell the court in camera what they had done. The court would say to the person, they're working on it, and there it would sit. And then after whatever you wanted, six months, a year, the complainant would go back to the court and say they still haven't resolved it, and the court would say, oh yeah, what are you doing? Yes, they're still working on it. So the right that Congress had given people to move this process along was frustrated by a combination of slow administrative agencies and courts that weren't prepared to become administrative agencies and actually make these things happen. It, the same law says that once a case is actually resolved by a commission, by the commission and closed, even if it's a 3-3 tie, it's then closed. As I mentioned, somebody can then go to court and get the court to review the agency's action and determine whether it was correct or not, uh, which sounds great, except then the Supreme Court stepped in and narrowed the standing doctrine so that even though the statute says anyone who files a complaint can do this, the courts are effectively closed to most people who file a complaint because they cannot show that the failure of the FEC to enforce the law has specifically harmed them. If you're a candidate, you file a complaint against your opponent for violating the law, the election ends, you lose, the courts say, well, you don't have any standing anymore. You're not harmed because the election's over. Uh, so even where Congress has tried to put in methods to hold administrative agencies accountable, the collective system has, has frustrated those. Sure, my name is Seth, I'm a 1L here. Um, so you pointed to that, that Bloomberg poll that, that said, you know, do you want uh, corporations and unions to not be able to spend unlimited amount of money in campaigns and both sides overwhelmingly said yes, but can you imagine if it was phrased another way, like, or else do you want to regulate money in politics more? You imagine there's a big partisan gap there. So I, I think I kind of know what Democrats say they would do to reform the system, but what would Republicans want to do post Citizens United to get money out of politics, but also not want to regulate it too much? Yeah, I've thought about that and talked to people on the Bloomberg question first. I, I thought they were good in not saying, do you approve of Citizens United? Because that has become kind of a catchphrase for s something people are told they're not supposed to approve of. So by going to the, not mentioning the case, but going to the, do you think it's right to allow corporations and unions to spend unlimited monies in elections, I think that gives you a more accurate response, the fact that the bipartisan, that both parties' numbers were so high uh, it seems to me really interesting because it suggests that the, the base of the parties, the <laughs> average citizen, is not seeing uh, corporate and union spending as benefiting the Republican Party, for instance, which is what I think Republicans in Washington believe is the case. So that leaves you with where is there um, some bipartisan support for changes? Um, to start with, I think, the 87% the numbers that say we need to, to change things um, are reflected uh, in elected leaders of the Republican Party. The, you had Romney uh, saying recently this whole campaign finance situation is a mess. We have to completely change it. You have average members of Congress uh, feeling that they're spending all their time fundraising uh, under comparatively small uh, limits, $2,700 an election, 5000 a PAC contribution, um, plus doing what they can to instigate the rise of a, of, of a PAC, a super PAC that will be out there supporting them. Uh, and I think members are scared of the amount of money that can now be spent by groups that are not candidates or parties. Uh, and thus, you know, whether Republican or Democratic, feel that, it, that we need changes in the system. Where the con so the first good news, I think, is that both sides are now agreeing um, that there is some sort of a problem out there. Then the question is, you know, which pieces are the problem and how do you change it? Um, the reason Congress has not acted on disclosure legislation, there's a revised Disclose Act sitting before the Senate, um, is that Republicans now, since 2010, uh, have held the view that 
non-disclosure of the details of corporate spending is helpful to Republican candidates. The, the theory, which was more or less publicly stated by the Chamber of Commerce, was if corporations have to disclose to their shareholders, their employees, their customers, who they are spending money for and against, they might not spend the money. And thus, if you want us to raise corporate money to preserve a Republican majority in the Senate, don't require the disclosure of our donors. That was the argument against the Disclose Act. Um, now, you know, more broadly, I think it's pretty clear both sides have dark money entities. Both sides are raising and spending a lot of, of undisclosed money. Um, in, the, in the big world, the truth probably, the truth certainly is that there are more corporations with much more money than there are labor unions and with money. And therefore, corporations writ large have an advantage here. But not all corporations are the same. Some do not want to participate at all in politics anyway. There's been a move uh, inside of, of the, <coughs> the corporate law field by corporations that have policies of disclosure urging others to disclose or seeking requirements that they disclose so that you have a level playing field. So I could see disclosure being um, less controversial. I mean, Truthfully, all it takes is a billionaire who decides to put a couple hundred million dollars into a secret Democratic campaign for Republicans to begin to think maybe there's not a great partisan advantage here in non-disclosure. Uh, and that, in our current campaign finance system, is entirely possible. It's the sort of the roll of the dice as to whether it's a Republican or a Democratic billionaire who decides to, to dive in with uh, undisclosed funds. I think beyond that, um, you are now seeing movement on the conservative Republican side by people, um, social conservatives, who are feeling left out of this money battle. Um, there are relatively few social conservatives who are also billionaires willing to spend a lot of money. And so the grassroots activists of the Republican Party are saying, wait a minute, we don't want our candidates being responsive to a gambling billionaire in Las Vegas who wants gambling across the South, or New York investment bankers uh, who have different priorities than we do. And so there's a new group called uh, Take Back Our Republic, which was founded about a year ago by the political consultant who brought down Eric Cantor, who ran the David Bratt Super PAC in the Virginia uh, Republican primary race. And he's been out trying to build a Republican constituency for finding a way to get small donor contributions to candidates, whether it is uh, tax credits, tax rebates, uh, a match. With New York City has a six to one match of small contributions. So they're looking for ways to find alternative sources of funding uh, on the Republican side. That has clearly not percolated up to Washington yet. Um, but again, when you look at some of these poll numbers, uh, I think it's a, a matter of time. Blue shirt, back row. And then if I'm missing on the sides, please let me know. Thank you for coming. My name is Steve Salcedo. If you could put an amendment into the federal constitution that would solve or help solve the problems you've been talking about, what would it say? That's uh, really hard. Um, I have to say, I am skeptical of an amendment. Two reasons. One is, you kindly let me wave a wand and put it in. Um, but the reality, of course, is you need two-thirds of both houses to approve an amendment to go to the states. You need three-fourths to ratify it. That's a huge load. Uh, maybe you can get it with 82 and 87 percent numbers. But again, I'm not sure the state legislatures are where the, those polling numbers are. So I think it's very hard to approve it. But the harder question is, what does it say? And it, it's, it would be a great, I mean, a number of, of law professors have worked on it. Um, I think it would be a great exercise for a law school class because the tension is if you are too specific, like overrule Citizens United, that, that changes relatively little. Um, on the other hand, if you're very broad, as some of the proposals are, and they say essentially Congress may regulate money in politics as it deems necessary, it's unclear where that stops. 
Uh, and, and the response to usually that line is, well, um, does that mean they can tell a newspaper they can't run an editorial because that's an expenditure by the newspaper endorsing a candidate? Uh, we, I think, would all say that's not our American tradition uh, and thus not intended by that amendment. But how do you, if it's that broad, how do you know what Congress can and can't do? So then the sponsors say something like, well, you can regulate money in politics, but only reasonably. So you can reasonably regulate money in politics, or for reasonable purposes, reasonable provisions, or, uh, but nothing in this shall affect the freedom of the press. So what have you done? Well, you have created a case that of constitutional interpretation. What is reasonable? What is freedom of the press? And that will, of course, be decided by the Supreme Court. So if you've created an amendment to the Constitution, which can only be understood by allowing the Supreme Court to tell us what it means, aren't we back where we have started here? So I, I think the amendment is, is difficult. There are many brighter minds than mine. Uh, so I would be, uh, would be open to what I've heard, but that's so far been the tension in, in that discussion. Making sure I'm not ignoring the sides. One up there. There's a, there's a mic running to you as you formulate your question. I'm Emily, I'm a 3L. Um, so uh, from my understanding from your talk is that there is still law of regulating campaign finance after Citizens United, but the FEC is under enforcing it. And I read a lot in the press about covering this election. You mentioned um, what Carly Fiorina's super PAC has been doing. There's um, articles will come out and say, a spokeswoman for the arena super PAC responded to my question. Um, there was a lot of, uh, in the press about um, candidates that were forming super PACs while they were testing the waters, but everyone knew that they were gonna run. Um, there are uh, other examples where it seems like they're crossing the line, but the FEC is not gonna enforce. Um, but the press will say things like, Jeb Bush's super PAC, which legally shouldn't exist under my understanding that there shouldn't be a super PAC that coordinates with a candidate. Um, what obligations do the press have to like point out when the law is being under enforced and what is, wh where's the gap in the press being able to cover this honestly and legally? Uh, great question. There, there was a charming example in 2012 when Governor Romney gave a press conference and referred to my super PAC. <laughs> Um, so let's back up on coordination a second. We have two problems here. The first one is that what the Supreme Court has said about independent spending, that it is by definition wholly and completely separate from candidates and parties, has never been the regulatory standard. The court said that in Buckley, the court said that in Citizens United. There's never been an FEC regulation that looked anything like that. They have, the FEC's view has been, well, you have to allow contact between candidates and super PACs. The question is, what is it there that we're going to prohibit them from doing? Which it's not, are they completely independent, which is how the Supreme Court talks, but what can they coordinate on or not? So there was actually a, not a, a joke, a true advisory opinion request issued, uh, given to the commission in the last cycle asking if they could make coordinated, non-coordinated party expenditures. Meaning, could they coordinate with candidates to do things that the law would consider non-coordinated? That's where we've been with the commission. A, a very murky area where the commission has allowed a lot of activity of, of coordination that the court hasn't. So it, first of all, we start in a very confusing place because people say, well, the Supreme Court said there can't be any coordination. The FEC says there can be coordination. So even there, we're now dealing with the subset of coordination, which is what does the FEC say is illegal coordination? So what types of activities break the FEC's very narrow regulations? That's where we now get to the three, three ties and the lack of enforcement is when there, the string of examples you gave, uh, the group I had, the Campaign Legal Center, believes that many of those are violations of the existing regulations. Narrow as they are, these people still went over the line. 
and yet there's no sign the commission is doing anything about them. They haven't done anything about the coordination complaints filed in the last four years. Maybe they're bottled up in that enforcement backlog. Some of them the commission has voted in deadlock 3-3 on. So the commission does not have a consensus of what is actually a violation of its own regulations. And that's the, the piece I'm referring to. So then you get to, so what is the press supposed to do about this? I think they're in a terrible situation. Everyone looks at it and says, well, these groups, you know, they have the what sounds like the same name. Um, I read an article last night as I was um, going through my email, and there's a uh, pro-Rubio uh, nonprofit group that is raising and spending tens of millions of dollars on advertising. And it is independent of, of course, Rubio, but it's independent of the super PAC, too, the Rubio super PAC just happens they have the same address and the same officers. But as the press person explained, they're separate legal entities. And, and therefore, super PAC shouldn't be responsible for what the nonprofit is doing. I mean, people look at this and, and end up saying, this is all crazy. Let's blow it up. Uh, because it's the, the common parlance of independence is so different from uh, where the FEC is or what they're reading about in the newspapers. And, and I know because we take a lot of press calls, the press finds this very hard to explain to people uh, for, for good and obvious reasons. And, and I think the result is they don't. I mean, the, the press has for years referred to Goldman Sachs gave $800,000 to presidential candidates in the last cycle. Well, it's simply not true. Goldman Sachs is a corporation that's prohibited from contributing to candidates. But what they mean is, if you go onto the websites that tell you who gave to candidates, you can find people who are employed by Goldman Sachs, and their candidates are then, their contributions are then aggregated. And the press then gets sloppy or does a shortcut and says they came from Goldman Sachs, causing people to think corporations are giving to candidates, which is one of the pieces of the federal law that's still in place. Okay. Yes, on the floor in the red hat. I'll repeat the question. Go ahead. Um, I, I don't need a microphone, but um, you painted an almost post-apocalyptic picture with the scenario we have now with elections and what's going on and how there's absolutely no like functioning form of enforcement. And the question I have for you, given that we have objective evidence of strong bipartisan support, is what's the first step to fixing this? Yeah, I, I, think, I think we are in a situation where the, the, the laws, no, no one created the system we have. Every once in a while someone says to me, so why did Congress think it was a good idea to have super PACs? And the answer is nobody thought it was a good idea to have super PACs. They just happened. Um, it was a, a result of a series of unconnected matters. I don't think the Supreme Court and Citizens United thought things were going to look the way they look now, as I hope I've made clear. And one of them is they didn't dream about super PACs. Uh, that came afterwards. So we, no one created what we've got. I think there is, as we've discussed, significant, <laughs> really significant public disgust with, quote, Washington, um, which you see in... 50% of Republican voters want to vote for somebody at the moment who has no government experience at all because they regard that as a positive attribute given where we are in, in, um, in their views in terms of, of what's happening in Washington. And I think the campaign finance system is a big piece of this because people, contrary to Justice Kennedy, do think that the system is corrupt, that people can buy results that people who can't afford to give contributions are not heard. Um, the problem we have is how to have that light the right kind of fire under the people who have to make the changes. You know, there are states that have initiative systems and put uh, provisions, uh, put uh, proposed changes on the ballot. Uh, there are a number of states in the 16 cycle that look as if they're going to propose uh, a variety of, of public funding measures. Uh, California has moved to, uh, there's a proposal to have an even 
California's done pretty well on disclosure, but they're proposing new uh, anti-coordination and full disclosure provisions as ballot initiatives. There is no such uh, vehicle at the federal level. So it has to be done through Congress. And so I, the answer is that members of Congress have to hear uh, the, the voices of the public and what I think is uh, a, a dull roar now uh, is going to have to become a, a, a louder roar uh, to maybe continue with that analogy. If the members of Congress are looking at those numbers and thinking that those numbers are true of their district and then people are pointing out that that member of Congress isn't doing anything about this problem, uh, I can see them fearing they're going to be swept away by an avalanche of voter anger and if that's the case, they will act. I mean, that is how Congress has always acted. The FEC was created over the objections of the leadership of Congress back in uh, 74 because the leaders didn't want to give up the authority they had to regulate money and politics through the existing system. But there was so much public pressure for change that they finally stepped aside and allowed the creation of the commission. And, and I think that's where this goes. But as I said, I wasn't being entirely facetious about that line about 59% of Americans who want to just blow it up and start over. I think that's a worrisome number uh, and, and one that I hope office holders will pay some attention to.